welcome back. So we continue our journey. The great blueprint provided by peer-reviewed science. To recap, every scientific article is peer-reviewed by at least two or three people, and it usually goes through two or three rounds, particularly in our field. So what you see through the science presented today is very well established, very well vetted fact. It is scientific fact. It is very top shelf research. And as you, we've discussed, we've brought here really the foremost scientists in our country. I'm very honored to introduce to you our speaker, Dr. Harold Koenig. And before I read his bio, let me just say that Dr. Koenig was really one to open up the field. I remember as a postdoc coming to hear Dr. Koenig speak at Harvard Medical School and thinking, wow, this is really possible. And your pioneering work really was the frontier on which all this is built. So it's a particular joy to have the honor to introduce you today. And so in more detail, Dr. Koenig completed his undergraduate at Stanford, his medical school training at University of California, San Francisco, and his geriatric medicine, psychiatry, and biostats training at Duke. He is board certified in general psychiatry and formerly boarded in family medicine, geriatric medicine, and geriatric psychiatry. That is very Dr. Koenig. He is extraordinarily productive even then in his training. He is on the faculty at Duke Medical Center as professor of psychiatry and associate professor of medicine and is an adjunct professor in the Department of Medicine at King Abdulaziz University in Saudi Arabia and in the School of Public Health uh, in Ningxia Medical University in China. Dr. Koenig has over 500 scientific peer-reviewed academic publications, nearly 100 book chapters, and more than 50 books. I promised you he was prolific. His research has been featured on many national and international TV programs, ABC, Good Morning America, Today Show, NBC News, and hundreds of national and international radio programs. Dr. Koenig has given testimony before the US Senate in 1998, US House of Representatives 2008, concerning the benefits of religious involvement on public health. He is the recipient of the 2012 Oscar Pfister Award from the American Psychiatric Association, the 2013 Gary Collins Award from the American Association of Christian Counselors. Dr. Koenig is the lead author of the Handbook of Religion and Health, now in its third edition, and I refer many of my students to that. It's an outstanding book, and also a forthcoming volume with, together with Tyder Vander, Vanderweel and John Raymond Petit, Harvard University Press. I am so grateful, Dr. Koenig, that you're here. We look forward to extending the translation from the blueprint of science to the augmented impact and reach of the chaplaincy. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I, I'm humbled at that introduction, I have to say. <laughs> Uh, Lisa's taken really a lot of what, what I you know, some of the work that, that I've done, she's taken it at a whole new level, really, in the research she has been doing at Columbia University. And I cite, as, you know, as I will now, I will be citing uh, some of her work because it has been uh, so really, so, <laughs> you know, the one thing that, uh, when I was talking, when I was speaking with Dr. Oz, I was on his show, they really didn't want to know too much about it. They wanted to see those images of the brain that, that Lisa, uh, that her team produced from MRI, structural MRI scans of the brain. And I'm gonna show you some of those here. I'm sure you've probably already shown them those, but it wouldn't hurt to show it again. <laughs> but uh, in any case, and I, I do love to speak with and two chaplains, I, you know, I, chaplains tend to be my, my greatest uh, colleagues in, in a lot of the work that I do, and uh, it's, it's fun. 
You know, chaplains are in a, a bit of a delicate position. I, I was thinking about this earlier today. I was listening to uh, actually the screw tape letters. I don't know, if, <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, um, okay, very good. Um, so I was listening to it, and uh, I guess you know, uh, you know, Wormwood or whoever it was. The, the older guy is advising the younger guy, the, the young devil. He's, he's telling him, you know, try to, try to you know, form his, his beliefs so that they are utilizing faith for some other reason. Don't let them utilize their religious beliefs as an end in themselves. And so I've thought a lot about that because, you know, uh, Religion and health, they're, 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 that's what I've been studying, and uh, there is some controversy over using religion as a means to another end, you know, an extrinsic use of religion to achieve health. So that, that there is that, and many of my uh, theological colleagues have had problems with that, and, and understandably so. But, but my sense is that we serve a good God, and health is something that is good. So my sense is that, you know, if we can demonstrate a connection between uh, religious faith and health, then let's, let's go for it. Let's go for it. So in any case, that's a little bit of an introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the impact of religion, spirituality, on mental health. Talk about the mechanisms by which it affects coping with stress and mental health. Talk a little bit about uh, a couple of interventions, religiously integrated interventions for depression and uh, also for moral injury and talk a little bit about moral injury, and then uh, describe some ways that chaplains can address moral injury in the military, okay? So um, religion is a coping behavior. And uh, as you all know, our soldiers have got a lot to cope with, especially if they're out there on the, in the, on the front there, you know, in the field. They've got a lot to deal with. A lot of them are young kids, basically, trying to, trying to deal with, with issues that, that many mature people would have a difficult time dealing with um, and being asked to do that. And, uh, and what, a, what a challenge, uh, what a challenge, under the threat of, of potential death, you know, in, in the work that they do. So uh, it's not surprising that many, uh, many uh, members of the military turn to their religious faith in trying to make sense of everything that's going on. Um, the uncertainty, the fear, loss of control. And if, you know, if that lasts for a long period of time, uh, it's easy for discouragement and loss of hope to set in. So, uh, you know, there's... Uh, now, this is my favorite psalm related to coping during the present time, and I would suspect also coping out there in the field in the trenches as well. But you all know this one very well. But you know, during, during this COVID-19 era, um, I mean, this says it all. It really says it all. There's not a whole lot more to say. Uh, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow or bullets that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague 
that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So there's a lot in there. There's a lot in there. You know, to, to meditate on that every day in the morning prepares you for the day ahead. Um, what, though, uh, is there any evidence, evidence in our scientific world that this religious coping makes a difference in terms of health? Uh, and that's where I'm going to very briefly talk about today. I'm not going to really review much of it, um, but a little of it. Um, it's in the three editions of the handbook and in a, a fairly recent uh, article, uh, book that, that, that I wrote looking at the research more recently. And then, then a very recent one in the British Journal of Psychiatry Advances um, that talks about an update on recent developments in research. So you can, there's the, uh, the and, and if anybody wants, if anybody wants a copy of these slides, PDF, I'm happy to send them. All you have to do is email me or email Lisa or, or somebody on the team. Um, so depression, most common emotional disorder in the world, especially among those who are sick. And you'll be seeing, in addition to healthy young men, out in the field and counseling. You'll be seeing them probably in healthcare settings as well. And so uh, depression is, uh, is less common among those who are more religious. Um, it doesn't mean that re deeply religious people don't get depressed. The, the dark night of the soul is well known within <laughs> the religious community. Uh, but in general, depression is less common. People who are more religious tend to recover from depression more quickly. And religious interventions uh, reduce um, depression at least as quickly um, as secular interventions, and I'll, as I'll show you, especially among those who have a religious faith. OK, and here is Lisa Miller's uh, famous article in JAMA Psychiatry. You know, <laughs> JAMA Psychiatry used to be the archives of general psychiatry. The only thing they would ever publish is, is like hard biological science. I don't think there was ever an article before this one in Java Psychiatry on this topic. I don't think there ever was. So to, to break that, that uh, barrier was an extraordinary accomplishment. Well, and probably because it was a phenomenal study. That's why it, why it got into this, this journal. This. So in any case, um, Neuroanatomical Correlates of Religiosity and Spirituality. So again, uh, have, did you show this slide? Somewhat, somewhat. What's that? Thank you for your kind words about that. But did you show that earlier today? Yeah. OK. All right, did you show this slide? We did not show that exactly. OK, good, good. Because this, this slide is really phenomenal. See all these? These are individuals for whom religion is not very important. Look at all these red areas. These are areas of reduced cortical thickness. The cerebral cortex is what makes us uniquely human. And among those at high risk for depression, because they have a parent or a close relative with depression, for whom religion is not very important, there are many more areas of reduced, significantly reduced cortical thickness compared to those for whom religion is very important, religion or spirituality. That was the question. Um, so you can, you can look all sides of the brain, all aspects 
of the brain. There are differences in cortical thickness between those, this group and this group. So, you know, it, if, if you want some objective evidence, it's hard to find more objective than a structural MRI scan. Uh, there's one thing about showing that somebody who reports are more religious also reports they're less depressed. It's another thing to show this. Okay. Um, and then looking at objective, if you look at incidence of suicide, you find that uh, religious people don't commit suicide as often as those who do not. If they, I hear you have a problem with some suicide in the military and among veterans. Well, you know, these, a lot of these, some of these studies are in veterans and military, members of the military, and it shows that, that suicide rates are lower among those who are more religious, who have a stronger religious faith. Now, the reason for that are multiple. Um, one is because they're less depressed and they have more meaning and purpose in life and they cope better with stress. So those are some big reasons. Some other big reasons are the threat of hell. You know, I mean, the Catholics used to, they used to really lay it, lay it down to you. You know, a mortal sin you could not repent from. You could not. So it was a sin that could, that barred you from heaven, barred you from ever seeing any of your loved ones again who had died or who were still living and would die. Now, of course, that's changed since Vatican, I forget, I forget which one, but that's changed because people who commit suicide are now thought to have uh, a mental illness, which, which, which makes perfect sense to me. Nobody commits suicide, you know, in, unless they've got something wrong with the way they're thinking. There is, so uh, now, you know, now that's not no longer the case. Now, of course, of course if you're a Muslim, if you're a Muslim, uh, it's the threat of what happens to you after death. They, they don't mince their words whatsoever. What happens if you commit suicide in Islam is that you will be committing suicide in the same way that you killed yourself for all of eternity, all of eternity. If you hung yourself, you'll be struggling for breath for eternity. If you stabbed yourself, you'll be stabbing yourself continually. The pain of that will for, forever and ever and ever. Uh, that's what the Muslims believe. That's why Muslims <laughs> tend not to commit suicide. Okay, so the beliefs themselves are discouraging to the notion of committing suicide. Here's a study out of the Harvard School of Public Health by Tyler Vanderweel, who has a PhD, I believe it's in mathematics, from Cambridge, who is an endowed professor in the School of Public Health and has invented many of the, many of the statistical methods now used to analyze prospective data. So what he found was that suicide rates um, were seven times higher among women, 90,000 nurses. Now, the nurses tend to be a very, very good. They report. They're, they're good in terms of reporting the data. It's very reliable. So uh, these 90,000 women were followed for a period of uh, about 15 years. And the likelihood of committing suicide, this is an incident study, so this is not just you know, are you any suicidal thoughts? This is actually the incidence of committing suicide and dying. Um, uh, that likelihood is 84% lower among those who are attending religious services at least once a week. 84% lower, and actually seven times lower um, when you compare those who never attend religious services. So this is a very powerful study, also in uh, JAMA Psychiatry. In fact, uh, Vanderweel said in the letter to the editor, now we know that the rates of suicide among women in the U.S. based on CDC report not long ago, from 1999 to 2000, I believe it was 2014, uh, during that period there was a 40% increase in suicide rate among American women during that period. 
he actually looked at the rates of church attendance and found that the decreasing rates of church attendance could explain, based on the results here, this 40% increase in suicide rate. That's actually published in JAMA Psychiatry in a letter to the editor. Okay, anxiety and PTSD, um, more religious. Half of studies find that religious people are experience less anxiety, um, and about 11% report greater anxiety. Now, this is a systematic review of the literature. This is out of the 2012 edition of the Handbook of Religion and Health. So anybody could reproduce the findings I'm, I'm reporting here. Now, why is it only 49%? Well, the reason is because most of these studies are cross-sectional, and, and religious involvement tends to drive uh, well, anxiety tends to drive religious involvement. There are no atheists in foxholes. Basically, when you're under a lot of pressure, people tend to become religious. So anxious people tend to gravitate towards religion, which forms a positive correlation between the two. And so that's, uh, that's probably why there are, and despite that, despite what well, you, you would expect to find a positive correlation between religiosity and anxiety, despite that, half of the studies show a negative correlation. So uh, something's happening there. And if you look at the experimental studies, you know, randomized controlled trials, 71% show a reduction in anxiety in response to a religious or spiritual intervention. So you can see it right there um, that, uh, that the religious interventions do tend to reduce anxiety. Alcohol use and abuse, dependence, again, this is a big issue. You know, the addictions are a big, big deal. They take away your will. They just, uh, <laughs> they take it away. You know, you become a servant. Uh, I'm thinking of what, I hope I, I, what that screw tape letter said again. He said, he, the devil said, he says, we want to um, make it so, we want to, during your down times, during the down times, we want to begin using pleasure, including alcohol, to numb your pain. And then, eventually, we want to make it so that you get nothing back. You get no pleasure. You're addicted. You're hung up on the pleasure, and you, but you get nothing out of it. That's our goal. That's our goal with addiction, to create a position where... You're hooked on it, you've lost your will, and you get nothing out of it, nothing. That's the goal. How different than what results from serving the God that we believe in, many of us believe in. Okay. Um, same with illicit drug use. And it's not just the bad stuff that's less, it's the good stuff that's more. If anything, if anything, it's greater well-being and happiness, 80% of the scientific literature uh, shows that. Only three studies of 326 reported less happiness among the more religious. That's less than 1%. I mean, if you study cigarette smoking and its effects on, your, on, on lung cancer, 1% will show that it, it improves lung cancer. I mean, just, just, that's just the way these studies are are, uh, you know, they report different things, different populations. Sometimes they mess up their analyses. They report the opposite of what they actually found. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Anyway, okay. Meaning, purpose, hope, optimism, all of them, all of them connected with greater religious involvement. And that makes a big difference in terms of uh, recovery and motivation for self-care. I mean, if you have meaning and purpose, if you have hope, if you're optimistic, you're going to do more to take care of yourself, to, to go through the, the difficult process of recovery, of rehabilitation after you're sick, after you're injured. If, you've got that, if you don't have hope, if you don't care, you don't have any meaning and purpose, why? Why recover? Why do the hard work, the painful work of trying to get better after you're injured or whatever? Okay, more social support, almost all of the studies. That makes sense. It's also a higher quality of support. It's not just 
increased number of social contacts. It's a higher quality of support. People support each other not for the social uh, exchange. Religious people so uh, do it partly for the, the social exchange, but they have an additional motivation that others don't, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. Even if it's hard, even if they give you nothing back, you are to unconditionally love your neighbor. We had, <laughs> we had an experience, uh, I don't know, my wife had our first child and, and uh, you know, our church started you know, bringing over meals until the refrigerator couldn't hold them anymore. They started to do our lawns, mow the lawns, you know, not, we didn't request that. You know, pick up stuff. I had to stand out in front and say, okay, go home. Please stop. You know, I mean, it, it was just this outpouring of, of wanting to help. So in any case, um, it's understandable. Now, religious involvement, really, it's, it's, it's something that affects people's health across the entire lifespan, beginning even before conception. Now, think about that. It begins, the, the influence that religion has on a person's mental health and physical health as well, begins before conception. It's been shown that the behavior of the father, particular use of alcohol, but also other kinds of, can actually influence the, the, the the future mental health of the child that, that he eventually sires. And of, of course, we know that, that maternal behavior um, affects the growing uh, embryo. Uh, if, if you have a mother who is drinking alcohol, who's using drugs, who is stressed out because they've got marital problems or because they don't have a, a husband. They have to work, they're supporting other kids. All of these stress hormones are circulating around affecting the growth of the brain of that developing baby. And consequently, um, when that occurs, later in life, uh, that person's gonna be more susceptible to diseases and illnesses, the, the, including their, their stress response. The, in response to, to various events. It's going to be exaggerated as a result of that exposure in utero to those stress hormones. And then when the child comes, when the child is born, the infant, um, many people, you know, when they have a child, uh, it may be a burden on them. You know, if they've got other kids, if they don't have, you know, a, a spouse, you know, here's an extra mouth to feed. Um, and yet that, that baby is depending heavily on trust, the development of trust, during those first initial few, um, few uh, years here. Hold on one second. Sorry about this. I know you probably told everybody to put them on mute. And so here I, you know, anyway. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're in infancy. So um, Religious people tend to really value children. As I think it says, the Bible says, the quiver, right? Arrows in the quiver, uh, something like that. Um, there, there's a real value placed on, religious beliefs place value on children. That's across the religions. Um, all the major religions value, place value on children. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that's especially true in Islam, too by the year 2060, there will be more Muslims in the, in the uh, I, th I think it's in the world, yeah, it's in the world, than there will be Christians. So there will be uh, three billion Muslim and I think 3.1 billion Christians. Part of that has to do with that the birth rate among Muslims much higher than among Christians. So in any case, um, the child as it comes is likely to be more valued but because of religious teachings. Um, then as the child gets older and they then have, have peer group influences and then, then the issues, then other stuff comes up. Delinquency, then there is alcohol, then there is drugs, then there is sex. They all, they're, they're just, you know, teenagers are just completely, uh, you know, 
uh, attacked by all of these, these, these things. And uh, religious, young people, just don't engage in those activities as much. So they're more likely to complete their education because they haven't gotten pregnant, dropped out, or haven't gotten delinquent and been jailed, or haven't used drugs and gotten, become addicted. They're more likely to complete their, complete their education. They're more likely to get a better job. They're more likely to be able to health, uh, afford health insurance, including mental health care. It just goes on and on. Then as you get, go into middle age, um, you know, then, then it's an issue of, of dealing with your colleagues, your peers, and if you have strong moral values, you're going to be valued more. If you're, you're loving your peers, not trying to take advantage of them, you're going you're gonna to have better jobs, and people are going to respect you on your jobs. You're going to have more productivity at your work. And then as you get older and you get sick, then you're going to really need religion. That's where, that's the Super Bowl. You know, we're not, we're not playing a high school team or a grammar school, you know, sandlot game. Now we're, in, now we're in the Super Bowl because then the disability occurs. Disability, chronic pain, loss of loved ones, limitations in independence. Let's keep going, you know. That's when you need religion. That's why older people are more religious. Another reason, though, is they might have gotten older because they're more religious, because they, you know, they lived a healthier life and, and uh, basically were healthier. Okay, so it's across the lifespan. Here are some treatments. This is uh, for depression. This is for cognitive behavioral therapy. For depression, CBT is a, is a great uh, framework to use because it's entirely based upon the scriptures. It's, very, it's almost like the psychologist stole cognitive behavioral therapy. Aaron Beck stole it from the, the, the scriptures uh, be, because that's, that's how the scriptures teach and form people through cognitive and behavioral processes. And so we have five different versions of, of, of religiously integrated CBT. There's Christian, Jewish, um, Mus Buddhist, Muslim, and Hindu. It's basically 10 50-minute sessions delivered over 12 weeks. And we've got, we've got tons of manuals, all free. You can download now. Just call it pastoral care. If you're a chaplain, call it pastoral care. Don't call it cognitive behavioral therapy if you're doing it. Because <laughs> otherwise you'll be sued, you'll be fired <laughs> because chaplains are not allowed to conduct therapy. You have to be licensed within the state to do therapy. But you can do pastoral. That's, that's your ball right there. Pastoral care. Just, but, you know, basically, um, it doesn't matter what you call it. These are ways. And, and basically, these uh, interventions go right to the scriptures. That's, that's what they're based on. So it gives you a little bit of a framework um, here are the example of the religious CBT uh, sessions. There are 10 of them. Um, you know, assessing during a spiritual history, assessing the person's religious beliefs, their language, and then explaining how it works. Um, um, introduce the use of scripture memory verses. That's the first session, memory verse. Remember you were a kid? You are like a little kid in... in they, they gave you memory verses. Well, you know, the way to get into the kingdom of God is how? The child, right? That's, how the, that's who Jesus said got into the kingdom. The child got into the kingdom. So memory verse. It works. We've shown it. Um, homework assignments. So they got to work hard. They got to work hard. These poor depressed people, it's tough. Anxious and depressed. They, they got homework to do. Uh, they're serious about this. Uh, alternative ways of responding to negative automatic thoughts based on their religious beliefs. Um, challenging unhealthy thoughts, integrating religious beliefs as a method of discovering alternative beliefs. Use of religious resources to make sense of loss, to make sense of it. And then using examples in scripture. Focus on spiritual struggles, negative religious beliefs involving anger, guilt, resentment, towards God and the others. Um, Job, you know, I mean, I, again, you know, the classic Job had it all. 
He was suffering. He was mad and angry at God and everything. And, you know, it worked out okay for Job in the end. Um, focus on gratitude. 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 Instead of grumbling. Grumbling. With examples from Scripture. Gratitude to God. Focus on altruism. Expressing religious gratitude by expressing altruism. Um, and then uh, stress-related growth from religious perspective, from a religious perspective. And then spiritual reasons for hope and how to maintain um, that hope by involvement in their faith community. Here's our randomized controlled trial published in 2015. We compared the religious CBT versus conventional CBT. That was actual, actually a spiritual version of conventional CBT. They did mindfulness. They did all. They did everything was exactly the same, including meditation, except for a religious component. That was the difference. Now you know, uh, basically, uh, they did about the same. Uh, overall, there was a very small difference, non-significant, that favored the religious CBT group. And among highly religious individuals, they were more compliant with the treatment, and they did significantly better with religious CBT than with conventional CBT. That was the religious individual. There was a, a uh, baseline religiosity group interaction that was significant. OK. Um, religious cognitive behavioral therapy, those are the uh, website. There's a website to download. And again, all the different, including two versions or three versions of Islamic CBT. You know, a Shia, a Sunni, and then a Pakistani version. I think there's another one that's coming, too. Um, training video now available on the website. So we got a, a brief training video as well. Now, th this was a very interesting study. <laughs> this is a study. This is one of the first studies of religious CBT for depression, okay? So that study was published in Journal of Consulting Clinical Psychology, the best of all of the psychology journals, number one. And uh, it was a randomized controlled trial. They had 59 participants. They had a weightless control. They had a conventional CBT arm. They had a religious CBT arm. And for a control group, they had pastoral care by religious professionals. So that was a control. The control, uh, it was a second control, basically uh, considered to be equivalent to a wait list. In other words, pastoral care by religious professionals was considered to be equivalent to nothing. Nothing. So here are the results. Pre-treatment, everybody's about the same. At the two-year follow-up, who has the lowest Depression score, it's the pastoral care group. Had the, had the lowest of better than religious CBT, better than conventional CBT, better than, uh, you know, they, they didn't compare it to them, but that it was certainly better than that. So this is, to my knowledge, the only study that shows very clearly that pastoral care makes a difference. So what is moral injury? So moral injury, you're going to see a lot of that, particularly as the days go ahead, you know, and as we continue to be involved in various warfare areas, there can be a lot of moral injury. Um, and, you know, you never know. This is, a, this is a dangerous and scary world that we live in. Um, so according to Litz, uh, Litz was a psychologist, uh, moral injury involves an act of transgression that creates dissonance and conflict because it violates assumptions and beliefs about right and wrong and personal goodness. Moral injury is a syndrome that often occurs in the setting of trauma, especially in the setting of trauma, such as PTSD. But moral injury is distinct and separate from PTSD. And our research has, has, has documented, has shown that, and I'll show you that in a minute. 
Moral injury is a relatively new syndrome that became recognized in war veterans and active duty military, particularly those with PTSD, because of the very, very poor response of PTSD to treatment. So PTSD, you know, drugs, the psychotherapy, you know, it really, it's only a very small percentage that get, that, that get anywhere near back to baseline. And so that's why they, they are looking, there's, there's something else must be wrong here, because we're not hitting it with the drugs or with the therapy. The uh, cognitive processing therapy, the exposure therapy, none of it's, it's reaching them. Um, moral injury also occurs in other settings as well. Police, firemen, emergency medical personnel, civilians experiencing severe trauma, rape, or being robbed, or any kind of severe trauma, healthcare professionals, including clergy and chaplains also, um, as, uh, and it's, it's often a cause of burnout. We've done studies showing that as well, recent ones, like just, just recently published, showing a, the, a measure of moral injury that we developed for physicians and nurses. Um, we haven't done it in chaplains yet or clergy. That's something that, you know, that still needs to be done. There's never been a study developing a measure in chaplains and clergy assessing moral injury, which I'm sure is also present there. Um, so uh, moral injury has both psychological and spiritual dimensions. It's not just psychological. So here are the events, killing, violence to others, witnessing violence, not being able to protect the vulnerable, being in a morally compromising position by leaders, being put there by leaders, uh, witnessing others, especially leaders, violate moral codes, dehumanizing the enemy, uh, plundering the enemy, rape, torture, transgress the moral code, resulting in moral injury with religious and psychological symptoms. The religious being religious struggles, loss of religious faith entirely, weakening or loss of religious faith, Psychological symptoms are guilt, shame, moral concerns, feeling betrayed, loss of trust, difficulty forgiving others, including themselves and God, loss of meaning and purpose in life, condemning themselves. All of that is results uh, or symptoms resulting from transgressing the moral code, resulting in PTSD or at least affecting affecting PTSD, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, relationships, problems, pain, and physical disability. So here's how uh, moral injury is measured. There are scales that measure both the event and the symptoms. But if you are also measuring events that you cannot change because they've already happened, that makes it less specific for actually measuring the intensity of the moral injury itself, the consequences of moral injury that you can change. So therefore, symptom-only measures have come about in order to assess the severity of symptoms and their effect and the change over time in response to treatments. We have two of those measures. This was actually the first one ever published, symptom measure. It beat the competitor by about a month because it was published online. <laughs> and therefore, uh, uh, the, the other ones, uh, Collier or Collier, or I forget his name, he's, he's, uh, he's uh, done the Courier, has done the Expressions of Moral Injury Scale. Um, so, so that was the one that came right out after ours. Then we reduced it to 10 items. This is 50, this was 45 items. We do reduced it to 10 to make it more, 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 more friendly. Admitted friendly, and then the EMIS M short form, which is only four items, which is Courier's short version of this. The only issue with this is it has no, there are no measures that are assessing religious symptoms other than ours. So there are no measures out there of any kind other than our, these two, that are measuring religious symptoms as a consequence of moral injury.
it's kind of funny because, you know, <laughs> um, basically what moral injury is in kind of common language, it's just sin. Transgressing the moral code. What, what, what have for thousands of years have, has it been called? We have a new name for it, moral injury. But it's really just sin. So here's our measure, the 10 item one for the military. Um, it goes through these 10 symptoms, uh, you know, over here. It goes through each of these 10 and those. So that's that. And then we have one for healthcare professionals. Like I said, it was just recently published, uh, just came out, and, uh, and been, been actually replicated in China among over 3,000 physicians and nurses. So how, how is moral injury different from PTSD? It's actually quite different, quite different. Here are the 10 symptoms of moral injury, and here are the criterion for PTSD. The only place where, where it overlaps now in DSM-5 is in this guilt and shame. Um, those are the only two symptoms that are overlapping. There's, there's no overlap in, in the other eight symptoms. They're completely independent. So they're related, but they're independent syndromes. Interventions for moral injury, there, is, there are secular ones that have been developed and then spiritual ones. Um, there's adaptive disclosure therapy, I believe. Uh, that's Brett Litz. The one that he developed, there's impact of, of killing. That's an intervention that, uh, that some of the guys in San Francisco developed. And then acceptance and commitment therapy, ACT, also is another one that's used heavily dependent on mindfulness. Then there are spiritual interventions. Building spiritual strength. This is by a, uh, a VA psychologist up in Minneapolis, Harris, uh, Jean Harris, um, she's shown it. Actually, she uses chaplains to, to administer it, supervised by psychologists, and it's done in faith community settings. So she's got a couple of randomized controlled trials um, that she's published on that. And then our spiritually integrated cognitive processing therapy. So a word about that. A manual-based structured therapeutic intervention Again, this is a therapy for moral injury among those experiencing trauma. 12-session, in-person, individual treatments delivered over 6 to 12 weeks. Considered a spiritually, religiously integrated intervention using a CPT, cognitive processing therapy, framework. Because that's what's used to treat PTSD in the secular world, in the psychology world. That and exposure therapy. Um, so by reducing moral injury, the goal is to decrease trauma symptoms and comorbid conditions, all of these consequences of moral injury. Several versions have been developed. One is the broad spiritual version, and we've got religiously integrated versions, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist types. And the only thing published though, thus far is, is this article right here on it. It gives uh, some examples of how to do it. And again, this could easily be pastoral care, but we don't need that because we actually have a very specific one for chaplains and pastoral caregivers. And I'll go over that in a minute. But right now, we're comparing standard CPT versus spiritually integrated CPT versus a chaplain pastoral care intervention for moral injury in PTSD among veterans. 12 individual sessions, licensed counselors trained in both SICPT and CPT, chaplains trained in pastoral care using a structured, manualized intervention. You gotta have a, if you're gonna do a randomized control, control trial, you have to have a structured intervention because you've got to replicate it. You just do whatever you want to, somebody else down, you know, a thousand miles away won't get the same results. So it has to be manualized so it can be replicated. Uh, follow up in three, six, 12 weeks, um, provide some pilot data. That's the purpose, it's all self-funded because nobody, you know, nobody's willing to come up with any money to sport stuff like spiritual things. 
<laughs> or really, certainly not a religious thing. So we decided, what the heck? We'll just pull it out of our bank accounts and do it ourselves. You know. So I've got a great team in Los Angeles, the LAVA, that are helping out. So again, the wages of sin is death and moral injury and PTSD. That's a form of living death. I'm sure that many of you can relate to that. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Thus, the treatment of moral injury requires a spiritual transformation. It's amazing that moral injury has been treated with completely ignoring the spiritual or religious part with, for, for thousands of years. That's been the way it's been treated. It's been treated through spiritual and religious ways. You look at all of the different uh, faith traditions, they, all of them were in war. You know, you know the, the Jewish people going into the promised land. I mean, my God, I'm reading right now, I'm re reading right now the Torah, the old part of the Old Testament. Boy, oh boy, they didn't mention, they killed everybody. The kid, you know, the animals, they killed the animals, the children, the women, they, they just wiped everybody out. You know, talk about a moral injury. So they had methods of dealing with that. They had to go through various practices outside of the camp. You know, they weren't allowed back into the camp until, you know, they had gone through all sorts of different ceremonies to relieve this moral injury, to cleanse this moral injury. Okay, so here's the manualized chaplain intervention. We've got a Christian version, but also Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, and Hindu versions based on the core religious scriptures. Um, Twelve sessions, 50 minutes long, focusing on the ten symptoms of moral injury. Um, those are the ten symptoms. That's what the intervention focuses on. And then we use these various treatment modules for addressing it. Just like religions have for thousands of years. I have sinned. Then, then mourning over the sin. Mourning over it. And then seeking repentance and confession, and then receiving forgiveness, being reconciled with God, and then atoning for the sin that has been committed. And so it's, it goes right through. It's, a, it's just like what, what religions have tended to do for many, I, I'm willing to bet you that, that in this randomized control trial that this intervention is going to beat everything out. All of the secular CPT, the spiritually integrated CPT, all of it. Because I think this is getting right at the heart of it. Based on scriptures that have come for thousands of years forward, have been filtered through time to be true, to represent truth. So in summary, religious involvement is related to better mental health in terms of less negative emotions, less substance abuse, more positive emotions. There are theoretical reasons why religious involvement ought to be related to better mental health and better coping with stress. Religiously integrated cognitive CBT has proven effectiveness for depression and are available to chaplains to use. Moral injury is a relatively new syndrome distinct from PTSD that occurs in those suffering from severe trauma where there is perceived transgressions of moral values. There are religious, spiritual, and psychological symptoms of moral injury, all of which must be addressed for complete healing, and versions of the treatments in the setting of PTSD are available for Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist faith traditions. Here's a little book that we use in our spiritually integrated C CPT and also the chaplain intervention. It's a little short book. Basically, uh, I think I have a slide of it. Of the 55 books, that is the very, very best. I, I think that when I, you know, as I get older and as I struggle with my faith, as I get sick and old, and I'm going to have that by my bedside. I give it out to my patients that I treat. And uh, Religion and Recovery from PTSD, this is a large book. 
This is a large one, um, and it really looks in detail at the role of religion across the faith traditions uh, in terms of recovery from PTSD. Moral, uh, here's the one I was telling you about. Here's my email if you want a copy of this with the patient manual, just send me an email. Um, again, we've got the clergy work, work patient, and then we've got the spiritually integrated CPT, and actually Michelle Pierce uh, has agreed to send that out too if you're interested uh, you know, in that. Even though it hasn't been tested, that's the thing. Neither of those have been tested, they, but they do make common sense. Then we've got five different CME training videos. This is separate, this is completely separate. This is for healthcare professionals, including chaplains as part of the spiritual care team. It's the fifth one. It's, uh, it should get you CEU for your, your clergy chaplain you know, certification. I'm sure they'll give it to you. All you gotta do is reference this, because it, it gives, we've got it for CME for, for physicians and nurses. They get, they get it too. And a very highly professional done videos. It was a Templeton Foundation grant. Uh, sign up for our e-newsletter. Uh, it's free. If you're interested in research, here's a book to get. I wish I could get chaplains to do more research, you know, but that's okay. We've had a lot of chance. In fact, our workshop, that this book actually summarizes this five-day workshop. Uh, we had to postpone it this year, now it's next year. Um, this really trains people how to do research on this topic. So uh, here's our website. A lot of interesting information here. Most of it's free. And uh, two minutes for questions. <laughs> OK. Hopefully we'll also have some time for questions right in the panel, so I didn't leave much time. I'm sorry about that. Okay. So do you know the author of uh, You Are My Beloved? Because there's several. Yes. Yes, I do know the author. He, uh, he's a, a great author. <laughs> Dr. Harold Koenig is his name. <laughs> yeah, definitely get mine. Get my version of it. It's a good one. It's a good one. I, me and my wife did it, actually together. It was one of the few things that uh, we actually did together. It was written specifically for veterans. The, it's, it's, you know, it's uh, the intro, no, the first page, it said it's dedicated to veterans and active duty military. It's tough to start, you know, asking questions when you've been listening, you know, for an hour, so I, you know, but you'll have time to do it, you know, when we, uh, later. Thank you, sir, love that presentation. Uh, one of my challenges working in the government policy world is to see a lot of the literature will say, you know, art slash past religion and spirituality. A lot of what you mentioned is specific to religion, the benefits of religion. Uh, as a religious leader, of course, I say amen to that, but if you felt that tension was in center and try to in order to be successful by all those government study and trying to find, well, in spirituality too, for those who don't have a religion, uh, according to a lot of your version, they have different religious versions. What are your thoughts of that tension that you felt that even? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, you, know, you call it spiritual. You call it whatever you want. You call it whatever you want, whatever is in vogue, whatever the government will allow. You call it that. But you use religion because that's the engine in the car. That's what's driving the car here. You know, <laughs> you, have a, you just have the frame of the car, then you've got spirituality, okay? But, but the, the engine is, is that. Now, um, I had another thought about that. That's, that's really an issue, and I know you all have to be really sensitive about that. Um, the only, just one little caution, one little caution. Um, Social workers, psychologists, behavioral health care specialists are all wanting to address spirituality these days. So those individuals are licensed, certified, trained. And, and I know, you know, I mean, I don't mean, you know, chaplains are very well trained, but, 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 They've got, they've got this in the government. 
So if you, if you are doing the spirituality, then number one, you're outside to some degree, outside of your area that is absolutely unique and nobody is else is covering it. Nobody else is covering the engine. You're the only ones trained to do it. So it could be that you might be working yourself out of a job simply because they're going to be, you know, they just as well hire a social worker to do some spiritual treatment. You know, but they, you're not going to hire them to do religious treatment. And again, I know that chaplains in the military, they, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're there to meet religious needs of patients because they can't, of not patients, but of, of the members of the military because they're isolated from their faith communities. And that's why prisoners have chaplains in prisons. It's not because of the health benefits, it's because they reckon, society recognizes that there are religious needs that need to be met. So with that caution, you know, I'm very strong on religion, you can hear that. And, and Crystal Park is a lot more reasonable in this regard than I have. Okay, so she could, she'll show you a lot of ways to do this, you know, in a way that you won't get fired. I could get you fired fairly easily. Okay, so in any case. Okay, so I think I'll move on, right? We're, thank you.